What's up, guys? Welcome back to the pod. Um, I this we're talking about NPR. We've got to talk about NPR. Of course, we're talking about NPR. Um, NPR is the intersection of, I mean, multiple tech personalities now, including obviously Elon Musk jumping in there. Um, you have sort of a, it looks like deranged lunatic running the company. You have people, you have people quitting, people potentially being fired, people writing for competitive outlets to talk about how biased it is, et cetera. I'm sort of, I was dropped in the middle of this controversy and obviously like started swinging. Um, but I think we should ground you guys in the actual news of it all first. And there's no one better for that than Sajna. Tell us what actually happened rather than what <laughs> happened in my sort of fevered imagination. Yeah, I mean, so NPR, I guess the news cycle around NPR began last week um, when a now former senior editor, but who was then employed at the company, published a kind of tell-all, um, really whistleblower piece in the free press. Uh, so Barry Weiss is, is free press, um, where he basically made explicit what many people have suspected for years, which is that after or during the, the 2016 election and the Trump presidency, NPR was basically consumed by Trump derangement syndrome that informed every aspect of editorial decisions that were made at the company. And so um, this senior editor said, you know, we basically made the decision not to report on the Hunter Biden laptop story when it came out. Um, this was something that, you know, our, I think NPR at the time said they weren't going to report on it because it was like not corroborated or something like that, but they didn't even pursue it. Um, he talks about how they explicitly made the decision not to, you know, give much credence to the COVID lab leak theory um, because they thought it was racist. And, you know, they were sort of all in on the the Fauci, um, you know, natural origin theory of it. Um, and it was really just this kind of explosive piece from a guy who said, you know, I'm a self-identified liberal. I drive a Subaru. Um, I guess he's the son of a lesbian or something like that. I, I um, mean, he drives a Subaru. Let's he drives be a Subaru, real. Yeah. Um, he doesn't hear it. And, yeah. And he's, and he was saying, you know, like we lost America's trust and it's, it's um, remarkable to look at the change in the demographics of NPR listeners from like the eighties to now um, when, you know, a few decades ago, you had a much more politically diverse set of Americans who was listening to this taxpayer funded media organization um, than you do now. So this piece came out and it sparked this sort of uh, firestorm of, of criticism of NPR. The editor was suspended uh, shortly after publication of this piece. He's since resigned. Um, but in the meantime, uh, journalists and activists like Chris Rufo start looking into NPR's new CEO, a woman named Catherine Marr, who was named CEO in January, but has assumed the position, I guess, last month. Um, and what they discovered is basically a kind of archetype of, I mean, Brandon was calling her like an NPC <laughs> leftist. I mean, she's, she's basically a, what is it? Like an affluent white female liberal. Um, uh, awful. and she, yeah. yeah, she's an awful. Um, and she, you know, has a, she started her career in the nonprofit sector. I mean, she worked for UNICEF. She um, headed up the Wikimedia Foundation. She has worked in, in nonprofits. She worked at Web Summit as well? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Uh, her, her CV is kind of a laundry list of um, like, I don't know, pro-censorship sort of Borg type uh, nonprofits. I mean, she's on the board of the Signal Foundation, uh, which, you know, has a lot of People are sort of AI doomers. Um, anyway, Chris Rufo, among other people, starts digging up her old tweets and finds like this gold mine, basically, where she's sort of variously calling Trump a racist sociopath, um, talking about her like cis mobility privilege. She at one point, um, I guess on a Zoom call, sort of says like the First Amendment is the number one challenge we face uh, when we're fighting disinformation. Yeah, not saving the First Amendment, the, the existence of the First Amendment. Yes, the existence of the First Amendment, exactly. Um, and that she thinks, you know, when she was at uh, Wikimedia Foundation, she said, you know, we do think that we should be 
censoring and removing content we deem racist, misogynistic, transphobic, etc. Um, so she's one of these types of people. Uh, but where we come into the story is um, did some digging and, and got some tips and find that actually she also has a long history of criticizing Silicon Valley and even people like you, uh, Solana, she is um, very upset about the influence of white male Westerners <laughs> like you. I get this a lot. Um, but so basically, I mean, she she has outlined her position against Silicon Valley most coherently, I would say, in this, this tw 2018 speech she gave uh, in front of the Oxford Union, which is a kind of mix of like a coherent and actually interesting philosophical position, I think, where she's basically saying, you know, like these multinational pub publicly traded companies uh, are able to collect personal information at scale. And this raises all of these, you know, questions about privacy and user experience. It's sort of similar to um, a book that came out a few years ago about like the rise of surveillance capitalism. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a interesting argument I think that she's making but then she goes on this tangent where she's like and all these companies are run by white men who you know actively suppress basically the voices of women and minorities yeah, and you can see all, this in their products not true it's to be clear we're run by Indian men <laughs> most of our companies are run by Indian men um the example she gives are like software like voice recognition software that doesn't recognize um, non-native English speakers, uh, you know, AI that has trouble recognizing darker skin tones. And she basically uses this to say, well, this AI is allowing us to, you know, this technology is allowing us to encode racism at scale. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, fundamentally we should um, believe that tech empires are a net negative for society. And that's, that's sort of where her argument leaves off. Um, and I can run through the list of her tweet stuff, but, you know, I, I wish that, that she would have just, I mean, so the thing I like about Timnit Gebru is she doesn't screw around. Like she comes in and she says, no, Sam Altman is trying to genocide all black people. And I think if you're going to be crazy, just be crazy. Get in there and give us what we want. Uh, I want to take it from like the very top and just, I want to start with the dude who, who the, like a whistleblower. I, it's like not really a, he, I guess maybe he's a whistleblower, but the whole drama surrounding like why he like, oh, he was suspended and this is oh, I'm clutching my pearls. How could they do that? Like, don't they care about free speech? He works for them and he that he went to a competitive media outlet and trashed them. I would have fired. He would not be suspended. He would be gone. You would all be gone. Everyone <laughs> of you would be gone. Don't fucking forget it. Um, I don't understand why people are pretending that's a shock. Um, I, I guess I understand why people are pretending NPR being liberal is a shock because we all have to kind of pretend. It's weird. It's like no matter what they do or how um, obviously biased their spin is, the story of them and of, of neutrality and the neutrality of our institutions is so strong in America that even in our criticism, we cling to the delusion of their neutrality. We're like, how dare you not be neutral? Like we know they're not neutral. Um, there's, there's like not really, there's not really a surprise there. Uh, I don't, it doesn't bother me as much when it comes from like MSNBC. I don't care. Whenever we trash MSNBC, MSNBC or Fox, whatever, someone is saying something stupid, We'll go after them, but I, I never go after their bias. I don't mind a biased media outlet. Uh, what I mind is a uh, is um, is an outlet that purports not to be biased, and then what I really mind is being forced to pay for a media outlet. And that is, I think, really why this is even a controversy. It wouldn't matter if it was just some like the New York Times or something. Even like who can we kind of know where the New York Times stands and where they stand? By the way, is to the right of NPR. They're definitely moderate right of where National <laughs> Public Radio is, but. The, why are we paying for them? I've never understood this. Um, I don't understand how it's legal in, in, in a few different ways. Like I, I don't know how it's not considered, you know, grossly unfair for truth-seeking outlets like Pirate Wires. Um, and I also don't understand how it's not in conflict with the First Amendment in some way. It seems weird to force Americans to associate with a virulently left-wing media outlet. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think. Um, I don't think that this would be a controversy word, not for that. I do think that NPR needs to be defunded. Um, I think the era of 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 us not talking about this is maybe finally close to over. And then maybe my last thought is just um, her tweets were not that controversial. 
like even the one kind of referencing, like kind of alluding to founder spawn as being part of the KKK. I looked at that and I was like, I've seen crazy shit like that for years. What's crazy is that it's no longer tolerable. Like she's talking about how bad the white men are and she's talking about systemic white supremacy and she's saying tech's a force for evil in the world because it's run by white men and all this kind of stuff. None of that, when she was tweeting it four years ago in 2020, she, she was tweeting it then as a professional who people knew and nobody cared because the culture was so different. And like, once again, it's like another uh, example of just how far we have really changed. And there's a question of, you know, what will come of it, if these people will be fired, if the institutions will correct themselves. Um, I, I don't know. I, I hear really compelling arguments in both directions there. Chris Rufo actually just had a really interesting debate with Curtis Yarvin, where they sort of parsed some of this out. Uh, Yarvin believing the institutions are rotted beyond saving and Christopher Rufo really being an idealist in this way. He, he thinks he can change these things. Um, but I, I do just think it's interesting. Like we are all really going in and just the world is so different. I mean, she, she has not changed. It's not like she's just now crazy. Uh, this is just what America looked like four years ago. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I think that people listen to NPR so they can look down on others. Like, it's like the most elitist. <laughs> like, it's like if my mom was a has like a PhD like, type show. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it. I don't even think we had NPR where I grew up. Like, it's just like it's something that exists. Like, if you live in a college town or a big city, and it's something that like upper middle class liberals listen to, and. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't even do people actually even think that it's neutral. I, I've never gotten that. I think people think that PBS is kind of neutral because if you watch like a PBS newscast, it is pretty dry. And I mean, the rest of it is just what, like Sesame Street and, you know, 36 hour Ken Burns documentaries about the Civil War or whatever. Um, but with NPR, it's like, here's a lesbian, uh, reggaeton band based out of Toronto. <laughs> and like, it's like, I don't know. It's just like uh, kind of like Gen X hippie show. They say it in that breathy voice. It's like, I'm Terry Gross. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking at the lesbian reggaeton band as she takes her Subaru to the Burning Man camp and discusses the, I don't know, endangered spotted frog and why this is actually the fault of the Western man. Yeah, I love when Terry love Gross it. like interviews like an annoying gay person or something like which. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. embarrassing. Like, should I interview Come like on. RuPaul? Or no, no, not, not RuPaul. What's that other guy? The Broadway guy, um, Billy. Oh, I know who you're talking about. He like wears dresses to the events. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And she's just like, so how did you get to theater? He was like, girl, I've always been dressing up, like just like going crazy on her. It's so <laughs> funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like. NPR is like kind of soothing. Like I used to listen to it sometimes um, because they would they would have like these fun kind of like human interest stories uh, where they're like, we found this quirky old man who lives in you know New Hampshire or whatever who blows glass. <laughs> He's like interesting for no reason. Um, but I mean, yeah, like it's, their politics are like completely like liberal and biased, and I don't think anybody. Um, I mean, if people are thinking otherwise like where have you been have you ever listened I don't know. yeah 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 i think that that's true today for sure but the entire justification in npr was that it was going to serve some vital public interest and i still i, I would love an answer as to why because you know this question gets kicked up and this is not the first npr controversy uh this is not even the first npr controversy that i've been embroiled in myself this is, you know, part of a tradition of NPR controversies in which NPR does some dumb shit and the whole country remembers that we're paying them millions of dollars a year to do that dumb shit. And they say, I'm furious about me being forced to pay you for this. And then we just move on until the next stupid NPR controversy. Um, I don't know if that's going to, I, that feels like it will happen again. You know, I don't even think they're going to fire Catherine Mayer. I mean, do, th like she hasn't responded on Twitter um, if they fire her, it sort of seems like it seems like they're capitulating to the sort of right wing ideologues. Um, you know, they're never going to introspect and think maybe I shouldn't be talking about you know over half the country in this super alienating way if I'm supposed to represent the entire country or something like that. I think we're just going to move on and uh, it'll be like this forever. But uh, somebody on my timeline characterized her tweet history as an in this house tweet tweet history, which is like very apt. I thought. 
it's striking how much of an NPC she appears to be. Um, and I think the question now is like, um, actually this, I'm, I'm actually just kind of cribbing from this guy named Daniel Friedman. He, he had a little, a, a very short tweet thread that I thought really put it well. And he, he kind of asks like, he's like, I don't see a lot of liberals circling the wagons around Catherine. And he says, probably because a lot of them were doing the exact same thing as her between like between 2016 and 2021. So it's like what, um, they're, they're, they're all still out there, right. With these tweet histories and they're all probably still in positions of power. And I think, you know, the question is like, what are they going to do? Like, (laughs) you know, they kind of just have to like put their, put their heads down and, and maybe like delete their old tweets, yeah, these people are fucking stupid. You can delete your tweets. I don't. All my tweets from twenty twenty are I would, gone. I would be deleting deleted my tweets from if the I was archive. Them right now. They are gone. Yeah, because I know I said some crazy shit back then. Not about that. I was actually kind of on the other side of it and went a little buck wild because I was in the grips of that or all addiction, which is kind of going <laughs> off. But like, no, if you still have tweets up from twenty twenty, delete them. <laughs> yeah, they should. I, don't know. I like to say some of us. We're on the right side of history. I was out there. I, I looked up. We recently had this tech mea culpa where these um, huge uh, investors and famous professionals were talking about the various canceled people and how they should have done more. And one such person was Palmer Lucky. They were like, "Man, I should have really said something." I was saying something. I went. I, I keyword. I like keyword searched my name, and it was like I had like ten likes because nobody followed me back then. But I was like, "This is outrageous." Um, but it was more. I think I was like. Uh, I, I attacked it in different ways. And I, and I also, I went after like Kara Swisher at, w- at one point for this. Like there were people there. It's just like they were not being listened to. Uh, we were in the middle of a mass hysteria that lasted. It was like 2017 to 2021, probably. It, like an actual mass hysteria. And there was just no speaking reason to anybody. And yeah, like the Catherine Maris of the world, she was one of a million. And when is there going to be any kind of, I don't know, justice for what they did and the terror that they inflicted on people? I don't think ever because honestly, they're still in charge. It's just, um, it's just they've toned things down. Like we've, we've. I think culture, culture has has at least shamed away the crazy speech. But those people are still in all of the positions of power. Yeah, they they don't want us to. Re- they're going to try to pretend it never happened. Um, after they had, they went insane on everyone. They went absolutely psychotic and they destroyed a lot of people's lives. People like Catherine mayor she's the prototype of a person that was doing this in 2018 and i think what we're going to see now is that they're going to try to brush all this under the rug um downplay what they had said and what they were doing and hope for the best i think it's our job to make sure it doesn't go that well for them to hold them to account yes we are the we are the journalist we are the media now (laughs) um i want to talk about what to do about these people who are blocking the bridges of America. Uh, I was in San Francisco just a couple of days ago and uh, I was on the day, it was like the Palestine protesters like day of outrage or whatever it was, day of look at me. And they closed bridges around the country and airports. And I think there was stuff abroad in Europe too. And they were all just like very mad. A day later, sort of in a dollar short, they tried to fuck up Google and got arrested and now are all fired, but that's a separate story. I want to focus on the narrow question of crazy left-wing activists, or let's just say crazy activists of any kind, of any political stripe, blocking a bridge. Um, I think that there are like, there's a distinction, an important distinction to be made here. You have, you have people who are just protesting in an annoying way about things that maybe you don't agree with. And that can take place in the streets of New York City. And you're like, oh, I hate them. Shut up. Leave me alone whatever. Then you have blocking a vital throughway in a major city. Uh, In the case of the Golden Gate Bridge, you're connecting Marin County to San Francisco. There are any number of things that are happening on that bridge from either ambulances passing, someone could be needing to get into a hospital. The last time, not this one, uh, the last time for sure I know there was um, an organ delivery happening. It was fine. Everything worked out. But like this is like important things happen on this bridge. And that's separate from the question of like false imprisonment. And if you're stuck on a bridge and there are people behind you and now you can't get out and you're there for five hours, that's just, that's illegal. People have gone to jail for this in the past. Now, every time the bridge protests happen, 
Um, and they're happening now in greater frequency because it's a meme. It's a successful meme. They actually get a lot of attention. We all talk about them because we're totally outraged. Uh, I would say if I were going to steal man, the Palestinian side here, they, they think that people need to know about this thing and they think that nobody knows about it. And um, so when someone says, hey, idiot, uh, you're just going to piss people off. You're not going to convert people to your cause. They don't care about converting people to their cause. They just want the attention on the issue. That's the whole entire goal. And then I would say what's really happening is they want the attention on themselves. Their identity as someone who who is doing good things is very important. And the idea of them getting arrested is part of that. The idea of them going to prison potentially is part of that. So now when everyone's like, what do we do to stop this? We've got to start throwing people in jail. These people were arrested. Or we, well, the first thing they'll say is these people need to be arrested. Uh, most people don't even realize that they were all arrested. They were immediately or not immediately as quickly as they could possibly be arrested and removed. They were arrested and removed. This always happens. Um, now they're going to be charged. This one was pretty serious, so they'll probably be in charge uh, with false imprisonment. People are already, uh, there's a link you can follow to if you were on the bridge to actually petition for this. Um, we are looking at a situation in, where, in which these people are going to go to prison. And many people are like, great, we want more prison. Um, I don't think that's going to end the bridge protests in the first place. And in the second... I think that's pretty harsh. I am a criminal justice advocate, and I think that all of these people should be given an option between, you know, five to seven years in prison or whatever it is for false imprisonment and attempted murder, um, and a very brief publicly televised flogging. And I know that's going to sound crazy, but I'm going to break it down for you. PBS should broadcast um, the national flogging and all of the people that month who did bridge protests and, you know, or something of this nature, we could probably have a handful of crimes in this category um, who have accepted flogging rather than prison uh, will be flogged. And the great thing about this, separate from the fact that it keeps these people out of prison, which is so barbaric, and I can't believe that people are still advocating for such, such things in, you know, 2024, um, separate from freeing them of that fate, uh, you're confronting the meme responsible for the protests directly. So now, instead of perpetuating the myth of these people as these heroic freedom fighters who are like fearless and I'm going to jail, uh, it's shattered because they're not going to jail. They can, they, they're free to walk around the next day if they can, uh, following the flogging. Um, that's replaced with the image of them like sort of crying and with their pants around their ankles, which is buffoonish and uh, and fun. And I think people will start looking forward to bridge protests rather than dreading them so they can get to the flogging of these people who they hate, which that desire alone ends the bridge protests once and for all. I've solved the problem. I genuinely believe this, but I know it's controversial. I would like to hear your perspective. Uh, the public flogging is very Arab. The Arabs are like the end of that. So maybe we did it. Amer Americans did it in this country. I looked into flogging. Americans have been doing so. The, the idea also, I think we have this idea. It's like, oh my God, that's we we could never do. We did do that for thousands of years, straight up until like 1950. I think was the last flogging. Like there there have been floggings. All of our founding fathers, they were down with flogging. Not they were the ones who wrote uh, uh, the they didn't like cruel and unusual punishment. They did not consider flogging a cruel or unusual punishment. Um, yeah. Uh, it's not just Arab. It's Western. It's super. It's like every every country in the world has had some for, form of this. And I, I think we got to get back to shaming, uh, to, to public shaming. Or I think at least, I don't know if we got to get back to it. I would like to talk about it. Just to be clear in your idea, Solana, you're you're talking about not whipping them with, with an actual bull whip, but pulling down their pants and like bare hand to bare ass spanking. I don't, like, yes. The, no, no, no. Like, I think probably like a, I like, I think like a wooden paddle. Okay, There's a lot of places paddle. you can get yeah. that done in San Francisco. Explore yeah, they'll, they'll do it for free. Also the streets there. Like, why are we pretending <laughs> this is shocking? They're doing it out there in a public parade. Like, we can do public flogging. I think a witness too much. Insult? No permanent. I don't want them permanently, you know, maimed. That would be crazy. But I think pants around the ankles, like mortifying, very painful, and like they should be crying and mostly <laughs> out of embarrassment, but mostly out of embarrassment, not not pain. You know, um, who was spanked in health as a child? Like it has like pretty yeah, but that's illegal now. I'm saying we got to bring some version of that back. I don't think it, is that illegal. To, I think it's illegal to hate your kids. Is I think it not? It depends on the state. Yeah, uh, maybe. so I, mean, I, I grew know. up in Texas. They like <laughs> they like electrocute mentally like, disabled people. I don't think that they're. So I hope like for your kids. capital punishment. Yeah, I think you I got, think like, seventy IQ, and they're like trial. 
corporal punishment was still allowed in schools in Alabama, I think, up until rec- very recently. Um, it was allowed in schools in Texas when I was in school. I was spanked in school. But that's school. there's no way that you yeah, were I was I was legally the, spanked as the, a it, yeah. I was in the sixth grade because I got into a fight with another kid. Did, and did I you go to a his nose. Was it a religious private school? No, it was a public school. Hmm. That's shocking to me. I know growing up a big deal. I, I knew about the- schools I knew about schools that were taught where the teachers were nuns. Catholic schools. Yeah, my parents would, both went to one. Yeah, and they, they would like hit the kids, hit their knuckles with a ruler or other sort of physical forms of punishment. But I n- had never heard that in a public school before. I mean, I'm looking at a map right now. If you look up school corporal punishment in the United States, on Wikipedia, it's pretty shit about shocking. This, I'm telling you, this is normal. Like, it's they legal kids. in Texas. Yeah. It's legal in public <laughs> still? schools in Texas still. Yeah, as of, well, as of December 2023. Um, it's legal in Florida. It's legal in yo what uh, a bunch we of states. Yeah, yeah. So that's why they're so well Matt behaved. Can put up the the map, but it's it's um yeah. I remember talking about this. Uh, if we can beat children for talking in class, we can definitely flog a deranged barista for blocking the Golden Gate Bridge. I think it's perfectly reasonable. But Sajan, you were about to say that you disagreed. Well, no, no, no. I don't. I mean, I don't actually know where I stand. I agree that it's clear that whatever our current approach is to arresting these people is not working because, I mean, for example, in San Francisco, the Bay Bridge protesters you were talking about who, you know, were they were they were charged with like false imprisonment, refusal to comply with the peace officer, tons of charges that could have at least theoretically landed them in prison for a year. And recently it was announced that they got out of trial Wait, you're um, talking about the ones before this last one? Yes, there, there this was is like- November. Yeah, so this is, it's analogous. It was the same thing that happened this time, just the Bay Bridge instead of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, they were arrested. They were charged. The district attorney sort of exceptionally decided to pursue the charges. Um, and they basically got off with a slap on the wrist. I mean, they have to pay like $50 of restitution and they do a few hours of community service and they're not even going to trial. Um, so... It's, that I didn't realize. I didn't realize they were already out because that one seemed yeah. serious. Everyone was so that one really evoked fury in the city, and I thought, especially because they were going to prosecute, I, I thought for sure this was going to be different. Yeah, no, everyone did. I mean, it was it was shocking. She was Brooke Jenkins was like the only DA in the country who was doing this, um, and or at least in, in a blue state, um, and they just basically walked away and also got a lot of uh, earned media from the whole thing, which is, you know, they called themselves the Bay Bridge 78 and they like (laughs) got all these, they had these rallies in their honor. Um, So I agree that arresting is is not working. My only concern, well, I guess (laughs) one of my concerns with flogging is just, I don't actually know if I agree that it wouldn't make them like martyrs, basically. I mean, like, you know, that it wouldn't sort of, benefit their public image in some way, right? Because you're saying it's going to be embarrassing for them and they're not going to be able to capitalize on it the way they capitalize on like their arrest photos and stuff. Let's tease it out. What happened? (laughs) People hate these people. Like we, I hate these people. Imagine you see like, I don't know, uh, what's a good name for one of these? Like like Sparkle Butterfly. Uh, It's a boy. And he's got like, I don't know, weird tattoo, weird, weird piercings and like a puffy blue hair thing. And he was just screaming on the bridge and there was like a pregnant mom trying to get through and he wouldn't move because he was like, fuck you, you're participating in genocide. Then he gets arrested. Then he gets, then we, the public are given a date and they're like, hey, like you're going to get the chance to see Sparkle Butterfly get flogged. It's going to be on Friday uh, at four o'clock. Get your popcorn ready. Um, I will fucking be there, right? I'm going to be there. I'm going to watch it. I'll be live streaming with my friends. We'll have a drink. We'll be laughing about it. But also Sparkle Butterfly is going to end up on like a leaderboard of like the funniest reactions to getting flogged. And now a big part of their story online is not that there are these people protesting. It's like, look at Sparkle Butterfly cry while getting spanked by a cop. And I think that that is mimetically powerful. And I think that it will change the way that we do these things. Um, I think that the the, the policing element of it, um, it, it's like if 
it's no one's actually scared of the cops. It's all it's all theater. Um, so you have to find some like competitive story within that framework that it's not like you you really want to disincentivize them with the spanking. You you want to change. You want them to be afraid of the way they'll be remembered. And mm. I think that I genuinely think there's something in that. Now, I actually had read, so there was a book that I was recommended a while back called, and I should plug it, um, In Defense of Flogging by Peter Moskos. Never actually read it, but it was summarized to me. And so that was like sort of bopping around in my head. Just the idea that you could, you could, um, you could introduce such a bizarre concept, such an apparently bizarre concept, and then sit with it and be like, well, wait a minute, what is the what is the place that something like this used to fill in culture? And maybe what happens to culture once the shame-based solution to punishment is gone. But anyway, I, I think that I think that, that fear would actually... St- I do believe that it would stop people from doing it. Um, much more so than, than even the threat of prison time, which anyway, we're not yeah. even doing. If you talk to these people, they actually think it's like a victimless crime. And I just want to be like, you shut that bridge down for like four hours. You know how many people shit in their car? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's all I can think about just as like somebody who's like been, you know, like, okay, I, I'm i like on Google Maps. I'm like, okay, I'm five minutes from 7-Eleven. I can make it. And then you pull up and people are like chanting about, you know, <laughs> war crimes. <laughs> and then you just shit in your car. And those people are not coming forward because it's embarrassing, but they're the real victims here. And so if there yeah. is a flogging, I would like, we can put them in like hoods or something and like distort their voices. But I think we need like expert testimony. Like you made me sh- I shit in a plastic bag. Oh my God, like the trial before the flogging. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> I agree. That's awesome. And I agree. Yeah, conceal their identities, but let them give testimony. That's like, such a good idea. Like kids watch me shit in a bag. They won't look <laughs> me in the eye. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's a traumatic memory yeah well, the, the other thing that we could do is just actually pull the protesters off the road yeah like they didn't florida no, maybe maybe we start there yeah well, i i wonder i don't want to i know it's easy to dunk on san francisco um but that i think that it was pretty dangerous like you you had a full so you had first of all they had str- they, it's a bridge it's different than in florida and miami or i think it was miami where i saw the footage it was like a regular giant road there was places to pull them it was a very different situation than you're on a narrow bridge um or relatively narrow space you have three they drove three cars up locked them to uh chain them together then in front of those cars they they chained themselves and i they put their arms in these like weird barrier things so like they really set it up in such a way as you could not remove them without doing serious damage to them, which is a very like terroristy way of doing it. It's like, you know, they're preying on our innate goodness not to to harm them. They know the system is good enough not to actually deal with them the way like, I mean, any non-democratic society would deal with them. Um I don't know. I don't think it was so easy as just removing them because they they also removed them much quicker last time um, on the the Bay Bridge. This is like within you know an hour it's done. My sense, and I'd have to dig into all the details here, but my sense from what I heard from people on the actual bridge and uh, from just the coverage of the way this went down and how long it took that it was actually very hard this time. Isn't there, Sanji? I think you know about this, but aren't there's legal structure in place that prevents. Um, cops from removing protesters in San Francisco and in New York, or do I have that wrong? Uh, just in New York. I mean, in New York, yeah, you're talking about the ACLU settlement. I mean, there yeah, was basically, so. so a lot of this comes back to the Floyd protests, but basically after, in the aftermath of the, the Floyd riots and looting in Manhattan, the ACLU <laughs> sued, um, I think they sued NYPD for like mistreatment of the, the rioters. Um, and they won a settlement with the police department, which basically implements, it requires the police department follows this very convoluted, like multi-tier system whenever they're responding to a protest where they basically have to get approval from these designated like protest, um, like officers who, who like sort of observers, yeah. yeah, observers or whatever, um, before they, before they arrest people, they have to get permission before they move people off the road. So there's this kind of, convoluted system um but that's in new york san francisco as far as i know doesn't have something like that but i I think in in the golden gate bridge situation it was definitely logistically challenging to get them off because they also throw their keys into the ocean 
or the bay. Uh, that's, um, really that's like their tactic. They're not like leaving their keys in the in the ignition to facilitate the uh, the the removal of the cars. They're yeah, but it's also such a funny a tow truck. I mean, get a few tow trucks, drive them up, and right. But to get the out. tow truck onto the Golden Gate Bridge when there's already cars, I mean, it's it's, it's doable. Obviously, yeah, they did it in a few hours, yeah. but it's yeah. yeah. Um, the idea of them throwing the keys into the bay as well, though, just further drives home the fact that all of this is narrative driven. Like they could easily just hide the key in the back of their car, like tell people that they're like, they don't have to yeah. actually do that. They're doing it because of the character of themselves that lives inside their own head and the story they're trying to project to the world about who they are and what they're doing. And so the only way that you're going to fight something that is just so entirely narrative based is with a competing powerful narrative they are heroes the only way to change this is to make them look like clowns and we don't do that enough i i heard that um anyway there th th we could go on um, about flogging forever um i certainly could got a lot of pushback it was like, he was like again it was it's like we should do prison we should do actually what about all of the hours that every single person there um, lost times what they get paid in their salary, and these few people should be forced to pay. We're talking like millions of dollars for them for you know a deranged. Unless they're maybe, I mean, a lot of them probably have family money, but uh, if they don't, it's like life-ending money. I think it's interesting that we think that those two things. Like, why do we think that those two things are less severe than a brief five-minute spanking, like public spanking? And I think it's because culturally, and I know I've been joking on here to a certain extent. I mean, I still think this should be an option, but I mean, I'm, I'm playing with it. Uh, but I do think it's interesting how like shocking the idea of public shame is to us now. Uh, we are really a quite shameless culture. And um, that is a very recent phenomenon that we've become so shameless. That used to be a very big part of what we were. It wasn't our only thing, but it was a huge, it was one of the pillars of society was trying to avoid this kind of shaming, this public shaming. And it's just completely gone now. In fact, you have the opposite river. You alluded to um, you know, San Franciscans flocking each other for fun at Folsom Street Fair. Um, that's a, like a, that's a, that's like a, what is that? But a, a celebration of shamelessness. It's like the, I mean, it's really the opposite of shame culture. I mean, that's, it's pride culture, right? It's like, no, 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 I'm not shamed. I'm, I'm proud. Um, you know, I don't know where that, that came from, but I do feel that that has uh, a sort of larger impact probably on the way that we do things and the way that our society functions than we maybe even give it, um, Maybe that we maybe even believe. I don't know. Yeah, but somebody told me one time that, uh, the reason that they have Folsom is because gay guys, invented it so that uh the castro would have become gentrified and i'm like how'd that fucking work <laughs> yeah i'm no, like what a now lie. it's like now we've got an army of queer women um <laughs> who are actually just dating men i am watching vanderpump rules right now I just don't 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 make fun of me for this don't hate me for this don't judge me for this it just reality television is important and i'm lazy and sometimes i just need my brain to turn off um, and I'm encountering this drama in which one of the characters has, uh, or one of the people, two of them are having a wedding and their pastor, because he's a real Christian, has problem with gay people. And of course, these people all live in West Hollywood and it's like a huge scandal that the pastor of these people uh, who lives in Kentucky and their wedding is going to be in Kentucky, that pastor has said things about gay people. They all get mad. And the two people who lead the charge, one is um, a bisexual woman who recently has come out and come to terms with her bisexuality while in a relationship with a man who she's still with, who is the other person leading the charge. Um, and he's doing so on behalf of his bisexual girlfriend, who again is dating a man, him. Um, it's like these two, it's a straight couple who are appalled, um, personally offended, not just like this is bad for these other, they're talking about their own personal offense um, here. Well, you know who got a public flogging this week was, um, or a sort of de facto, uh, like a virtual public flogging was Humane AI. Brandon, tell us the drama. Sure. Um, <clears throat> just for readers who don't know, or sorry, listeners who don't know what Humane AI is, um, it is a wearable AI device um, that's sort of part of this first heat of companies making attempts at taking AI from the laptop and the phone and getting it onto a, onto a device. Um, 
the this humane it's called it's called the AI pin by humane. Basically, what it is is it it's a multi mul, uh, multimodal AI that you can talk to and it will speak back to you. So it it's like auditory, and it's also visual. So it has a projector and it projects onto your hand if you, if you want to look at its results. And the way that you can control it with the projector is you have these sort of intuitive hand movements that allow you to scroll through um, different options or or show different things that you want to see, such as like the time of day, the temperature outside, or whatever it is. There's been kind of a long hype cycle around Humane. It's been like I, I covered it in the White Pill Gift Guide. Uh, you know, now we're talking six six months or so ago. But I, 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 it recently hit the market and people are starting to finally get it and, uh, and, and be able to use it. And um, the, the feedback and the reviews have been like pretty much overwhelmingly negative. Um, and, and most recently, this uh, very, very big YouTube tech uh, reviewer called Marcus Brownlee, he put out a review that it was titled something like, this is the worst product I've ever reviewed in my entire YouTube history. Um, I watched the video and he actually, he's very, he's very fair um, with his review. Uh, the title is, is, you know, kind of clickbait, but he does make, he justifies the title with, with how he criticizes the device. Um, and he ultimately lands on this point where he's like, look, like smartphones are not going away. And this device has not, is not disrupting that format yet. Um, so that's kind of the controversy. Um, and yeah, like it's sort of sad to see. I, I intuitively like want Humane to win because they're they're really casting right now for a different format and they've come up with something. Um, and it also, I wanted to say, reminds me um, of, I don't, maybe Solana, you, you remember this. Our, our older listeners will remember when we were transitioning from like Walkman and Discman to the iPhone. There yeah. was all these like like for ten years. What what we did was we went to this this like uh, funny format of like a MP3 player, pretty much. I remember I had a, a Sony Mini Disc player, um, and it, we basically like we the, the market couldn't decide the best the best format for a device that played MP3s. Ultimately, we landed on the iPod, which turned into the iPhone. But I feel like we're in that period right now with the AI device. Like we can't quite figure out how to get the AI off of our laptops into something that feeds the AI to us, at, you know, like all the time. Um, but people like Humane, companies like Humane are like the early players, like trying to figure this thing out. And that's why I like Humane. Though after watch after watching Marques's um, review, it does seem like not a very well uh, designed uh, product. I think that's such a good point you just made about that period of time and hearkening back to that and the excitement of that. Uh, it was not just MP3s. It was it was tech devices broadly. I remember you had video games that were handheld that you could buy at the mm -hmm. store for one game, like a throwaway type game that you would be like your Street Fighter thing or whatever, Home Alone 2. Um, I saw uh, a short, it was like an Instagram reel recently. They were, they were looking at these... Um, like old phones you could get, like a giant phone, like a like a Hello Kitty phone, and like you picked it up and whatever. There were all these weird things you get at the Hot Topic, like just technology came in strange shapes. There were a million different kinds of phone you could get. There, compared to the the iPhone, at the same time you had the BlackBerry was still happening, and there were other kinds of text devices and things like this. It was um, what we're really talking about is the world before Apple. Period. And I think we forget how enormous Apple has become and how much of all of that stuff it has really swallowed up, including our computers. Every, I mean, Apple, the Mac 20 years ago was like the cool, it was like it had this cachet as like a thing that cool kids did. Like, you, oh, you, you work at a coffee shop. You have a Mac, I bet. Like that, it was, it was that. It was like you were a hipster. Um, now it's all we have. And I agree. Like, it's been nice to see this. It's like... Um, when there's an extinction event and then all there's like all this evolution that happens and all these like weird fucking animals show up and like most of them go extinct, but it's like very yeah. cool for a minute. Um, that is sort of where we are 
I think, I, I hope, because I, I, it's like the early days of that still, but there are all sorts of interesting hardware things happening. It's still not yet that huge rush. Um, and I can't even quite put my finger on why it's happening right now. Doesn't this kind of seem strange? It's not like there's this huge, they're not all AI based. There are other things like they're like Soul Reader. And I mean, there, there are a bunch of different kinds of hardware things being designed. I think it's almost just like people got bored and they, they want to do it. And maybe that's good enough of a reason. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, the other sort of AI wearable contenders, I think, are that it's obviously like the Apple Vision Pro, and then there's Meta's um, Ray Bands, which are also very interesting looking. Mark has reviews them as well, um, but maybe you would include Apple Watch in that category too. Um, yeah, but Humane or... really feels like a like one of the first true AI wearables. Dude, I hate the Apple Watch. I don't want that shit on my wrist. I don't want... It's like th maybe the other oppression that I'm feeling or pressure that I'm feeling is just from the technology itself. But, you know, the phone feel... The phone in my pocket already feels like m more of an imposition than I want. You know, I want less of an imposition on me from the technological world. I, I find the internet to be very exhausting. I know that I kind of uniquely live a lot of my life there. So I, probably everyone's different to some degree, but... Um, I was never a, a watch guy. I want I want fewer notifications. Yeah, I I agree. And I mean, I think there's a couple of problems here. Like for one, humane AI, AI it's a gay name. Like let's <laughs> just be honest, it's not like what do you wear? Oh, it's a humane AI. It's like, like it's just the marketing is ugh. and it's like a ugly brooch or something. I don't know. Like it's just like why that? Like why do you why on your chest? It's there's just a lot of things about it that like are like aesthetically unappealing and uh, not even in like the ironic way that like that the Apple goon glasses were. Um, and I don't know. I just think a lot of this shit is fucking goofy and that's why people don't like it. And I don't. Why do I need to read shit on my hand? Like I have my <laughs> phone in my hand. I don't need to like it just doesn't make any sense to me. Frankly. Like I don't I think people are like. They're just like, like it's pe people are pitching things and they're like, oh, like that sounds cool in theory. But then it's you like, know, the iPhone actually... didn't make sense. I, I'm old enough to remember the iPhone not making sense to people. People were like, I don't need all this on my phone. What do I do? I just need it to make a call or whatever. Like we were still living in a world where we thought calls were going to keep happening. I mean, do you, when's the last time? I don't have calls unless someone has a gun to my head. Like that was considered like the iPhone was, it was like you, the killer app on the iPhone was the phone still, of course. So why don't I just get a much simpler phone? And it just, it wasn't, there was a whole behavior that we didn't realize was going to become a much bigger part of our lives. And that I think, I think that's the value prop for something like human AI is that there is this other world of things that are going to be happening that we don't quite know about. And which I think is fair. And uh, it's like a fair speculative thing in the world of AI. I mean, AI should conceivably change everything if it's going to, if it's even close to what um, proponents and people working on it are saying. I think the other challenge that devices like these are trying to address is just the latency issue between the fact that you have to type with your thumbs onto an iPhone and you, you get an answer after that. It's much faster to speak and even faster to think your question. Um, and now I'm re referencing like Neuralink, for example. Um, I think that I think that is one of the challenges of of our next generation of devices is just decreasing the latency um, such that you don't have to type things with your th with your thumbs. Um, and so, yeah, I think Well, you can do like tech speech to text. That's true. One. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, I feel I, I never used that. Like it's been, I've had a phone that can let me do that for like five years now. And I'm like, I think I've only ever done it when I like driving or something, just because I don't want people know to know what I'm texting. Like I don't want to be in the grocery store. Like, yeah, people who know, speak, it just feels weird speak text are like always older boomers. I yeah, yeah I speak text sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> boomers and zoomers, I guess. Um, as far as the Neuralink thing, I, I don't know. I don't want like. Uh, my thoughts to go direct to email. You okay, know what I brain mean? cuck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, the, I don't know. There's like, there's a reason that like, uh, I don't know. Like, do we really, how would that even work? Like, do you have to think send? Or, I mean, that's I don't not know, even maybe well, being we, don't like, we don't have to go there because the first thing it's doing is helping people with paralysis play chess and shit. Like, I sure, think that's I mean. like, we just let them do that. And then 
probably the use case. If there's a use case at all, it'll emerge. I agree with, listen, I'm not trying to get microchipped, okay? Like that's not a thing that I'm excited about right now, but I'm also not a paraplegic, um, thank God. And so I feel like that, like that's an interesting thing there. There are use cases in some of this stuff. It's just, but I agree. I mean, the thing about Neuralink, it, it, sometimes the technologists will do something that is, or create something with a story that is just sort of implicitly a little bit dystopian. That's sort of, I mean, VR is kind of that, right? We see it reflected in the fiction. It's dystopian. It's very dystopian. It's like if a world is so good, it, the pr only possible victory for VR is that it's just as realistic as the real world. And if that's the case, then what is it but an exit from the real world and the real world crumbles, um, which actually works as a perfect segue into our final piece here, which is a piece that I wrote called Exit First Built. Um, couple of themes in here, and uh, I want to just get to you guys as fast as I can, so I'll summarize them pretty quickly. First of all, check it out on Firewires. Uh, the premise of it is, well, it's really a discussion of these two concepts, or really this one debate in largely in the tech industry that we've been having for years now, it feels like, really since 2020, when we first all faced uh, the maybe just full extent to which our important and cherished institutions have kind of rotted to their core. Um, what is a city but a series of institutions? Um, same thing as a country. And in the context of San Francisco, let's say, we we have this debate over whether we should um, you know, work there hard to fix it, which was framed as voice, or to leave, which was framed um, as exit. And then there are a variety of different forms of exit. One is just going to a different state. One is sort of leaving behind the world of government completely and just building companies. One, in the sort of purest uh, instantiation, would be uh, the concept of network states and building digital community. And like, we're going to have, we don't have anything in common. It's not the problems aren't these cities or the institutions. The problem is like, we are a different emergent class and we have more in common with people, you know, tech workers in Nigeria than we have with like a barista in San Francisco. Um, and that was really called into question during the Paul Graham thing, which we talked about last week. Paul Graham versus the nation of Nigeria over the question, uh, over the word Delve. Those people were largely tech workers. And that was the first time I started thinking like, well, wait a minute. Um, I don't have more in common with people freaking out over the word Delve than I do with you know a barista who I sort of disagree with in America. I'm an American. Um, and I started really thinking about uh, themes that we've written about here at Pyrowires for a very long time. Um, just, you know, how do you build, how do you rebuild a city where you live? I think it's like change. Basically, I think you could distill it down to, I believe change doesn't, you don't need some giant, you know, world altering strategy, like with the guy on the whiteboard, the meme of him sort of like put piecing the conspiracy together. It starts on a city block and that's it. Um, the piece I want to talk to you guys about first. So go check out that whole thing. It's a whole big thing and we'll debate it uh, in the chat on Friday when this is uh, airing. Um, it, I got the idea first for it, uh, the premise that became the story, the sort of kernel at the Museum of Natural History, which has recently taken down the statue. It was Theodore Roosevelt. So famously, there was a, well now, infamously, there was a statue of, massive statue of Teddy Roosevelt at the, at the museum, flanked by uh, a black guy and uh, like a Native American dude. And this was framed very recently as racist. And it was like, oh, there's like a racial hierarchy here, blah, 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 blah. It was created by a guy who was like super against the Trail of Tears and um, had, uh, I believe that's what it was. I, I was looking back at him talking about the way the Native Americans were treated and whatnot, the sculptor. Clearly, this statue was designed to evoke racial harmony and unity. Um, all throughout the museum, you see uh the signs of 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 this mentality to sort of like take down our heroes and say no 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 we're bad we're white supremacists whatever that thinking is baked in every exhibit um or let's say every uh, every exhibit that's younger than a few hundred years old um it's like either people are bad in general white people bad specifically uh i googled their dei manifesto that that sort of precipitated this entire change the museum it was uh published in 2018 and in it, they use the word global. They say, we are a global institution. And I got to realizing like, that is actually the key to all of this. It's not about weird and anti-human environmentalism. It's not about DEI. It's not even about Marxism. Like, What do all of these things have in common? They have in common this idea that we're not American. 
Like the global perspective is not a thing. You cannot have a global perspective because you're an American. Uh, you cannot be a global institution that is located in New York City, run by Americans, funded by Americans, visited almost entirely by Americans. You are hopelessly American. There's no escaping your Americanness. All I'm really hearing when you say that you're global rather than American is that you hate yourself. Um, and I, I think that that's the high level thing maybe that exists in society right now that we're all struggling with is, uh, is self-hatred. And that's where maybe, I don't know, what do you guys think about? I know it's like a very sort of heady kind of concept, but um, I see it everywhere. I've, what do you guys think about that? I mean, I agree. I think that, well, I've always sort of thought that like the the way that America particularly exports its like racial taxonomy to other countries and tries to impose that um, on countries that are, you know, have a different history than we do and a different ethnic makeup has always it's always been weird and it sort of has the biggest uptake among like the university educated sort of professional managerial class that probably shares the most similarities globally. I mean, this is something that people have talked about for a while that there's this kind of rootless elite um, who travels all the time and doesn't really feel a particular sense of belonging to place. And they're the only people who can entertain this fantasy of like, you know, we could have a global community, right? Because um, you know, we have sort of people who are ideolog ideologically like-minded um, around the world from us. Uh, but I mean, I, I would question when the people, when people talk about this, I would be interested to know who they identify as their global analogs and like where they were educated, um, you know, what their beliefs are. Like, I think you're going to actually find that it's a very small group of people who probably went to like similar universities um, and, you know, obviously most of this stuff is happening in English. Um, so a lot of these people probably if they're, if they grew up abroad, maybe went to international schools or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's a fantasy, uh, that in some ways is informed by not having like actually, um, read a lot of history or sort of interacted with a lot of people who are not part of these, who are not constantly, you know, traveling in this way. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting because generally what we're talking about is sort of framed as wokeness. It's like, oh, these people who, these are these nasty elites who hate the common man and like they think they're better and they have all these weird, lang this strange language of DEI and whatnot that they impose on us. Um, but when you framed it the way you just did, we talked about, uh, you know, I'd be curious who they are and who they think their analogs are abroad and like what language they speak. I also thought like, well, what what religion, like what God do they worship? And um, like, what is their, what history do they have? What, who do, who, who, what do they love? Like, what are their, what, col what cultural things do they like a lot? Um, I started, it's, it's very tech. Like it, like the people who could do this are very potentially, the, t the tech scene is as close as you could get to that in terms of shared values and, and whatnot. And even still, I think it's a huge, there's a huge divide, uh, a massive, there's an ocean between um, American technologists and I think like, you know, a product manager in Lagos or something. I think it's very, very, very different culturally. It doesn't matter if they have a similar job. Um, but in this way, like the network state concept is kind of the first, it's kind of the, it's like a, it's a, it feels a little bit woke. <laughs> Like I hate to say it, but like it's like it's it sort of seems like a woke fantasy um, in uh, in a sense. I don't. I want to be. I want to be tentative there and be open to pushback. But that's kind of what it feels like now. What, when you say that it's a woke fantasy, are you talking about like uh, all the tech people coming together and like creating well, we're a global community? So the idea that there are global values that are transcendent of American value, it's super anti-nationalist, the network state fundamentally. In fact, Balaji has said like, um, it, the internet is the new America and stuff like this. I, uh, and what that implies, obviously I'm not saying they have the same values as like your, your sort of standard world college professor, very, very different values. But what they have in common is the belief that their community transcends borders and that they are a global community which is like what was that was global was marxism not the first like, yeah that, was, that sounds like the international proletariat yeah yeah it's like those th those are all that's not i am not global 
And global is a thing that I am like, really, 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 really not. And much more so that I'm not woke, much more so that I'm not an anti-human environmentalist, much more so that I'm not a Marxist. I am not global. I am American. And and I was made in America. I am fighting for America. If America goes down, I'll go down with it because where the fuck else am I going? It's like, it sounds really exhausting to start over somewhere else. This is my country. Um, I feel that we are very different than other places and and distinct. And I, I just think it's, um, not only do I think it's sort of immoral to run away that way and uh, betray your country for some other sort of fantasy country, um, I think it's illogical. I don't think it's actually possible. I think the only people who pretend to not have these sorts of nationalistic values are Americans who hate themselves. There's no one in the thing that we saw last week with Nigeria was like, it was not like the Nigerians were being bad or something. It was Nigerians saying we're Nigerian and we're proud of being Nigerian and they're petitioning for Nigerian culture broadly. There's no such thing as a global culture. There are people fighting for their own culture. Um, and it just seemed strange to us because in America, the default state is to hate yourself. Sorry, River. Yeah, I agree. But I also just think that hanging out with people who have the same job as you or like, like are in the same social class as you, even if you want to narrow that down to just tech which are just like a subset of like the professional managerial class, or I guess like if you want to use a Marxist term, like the bourgeoisie, like as your founders. But like to me, that's just I don't know. Like my, my I work in media. My husband's a bartender. Like I have friends who are like Amazon drivers, and like and I also have people who are like are like publicists and like work in like media or writers and stuff. And it's like it's actually interesting to have a diverse group of friends and to like be in contact with people who are outside of your like social class and social milieu because otherwise you become very narrow and you become delusional and you start thinking that you have more in common with somebody in Nigeria than like you know um a guy who another American guy who's like pretty similar to you in a lot of ways but just has like a lesser paying job in a different industry that's insane yeah, or voted even just like the difference between, I don't think the difference between, let's say a more moderate guy who votes Biden and a more moderate guy who just tilts Trump, the the difference between those two guys is nothing compared to the difference between the average Trump supporter and the average Nigerian. Like, what are we talking about here? It's just completely, it's a total delusional worldview. Um, and the more that we pretend that that's real and give it any kind of legitimacy, I think the less we spend on ourselves and sort of rebuilding our culture and rebuilding our cultural institutions and things like this. Um, I think this is just symptomatic of Americans' unique um, denial, I think, that some, like they, they we, we can't have this conversation about how some cultures are actually better than other cultures. And I think that's what, like, we're not willing to say, like, I don't want to live with a bunch of people from another culture because actually like their customs and their values like kind of suck and it would not be fun to live with those people. Right. Um, it's really easy to prove this. You know, you could say um, to a woman who lives here in America, who has a job in San Francisco, would you, would you prefer to live here? Let's say one of the Google protesters, right? Do you prefer to live here or would you like to go, let's say, to Syria where you have to wear a niqab and you have to like literally when you're eating, you have to put your fork underneath the niqab just to get the food to your mouth underneath this thing? Which one do you prefer? You have to make the decision right now. So I, I think, you know, like that's what Balaji even misses, right? Like if he, if, if, oh, I don't know, does Balaji want to have a physical location for this network? Yeah, state? it leads to, the idea is that it would lead, you start with online law and online online community, online law, and then you find these um, either, uh, either sort of, uh, what are they called? The states within a state? Um, a micro state? So sovereign territories or something well, like that? Charter cities. So you could do some form of a charter city or a whole ass new country on an island or something. Some version of that in that world, which we've been talking, this is like a theme that's existed since the world of seasteading where I came up. Um, it'll, some version of that will take place, but only after the online community. He's sort of very, it's a very interesting idea. He's, he's wedding a lot of different ideas over the last 15 years in in um, sort of like the intellectual tech spaces together to, to conclude in the network state. Um, I don't know. 
Avoid global, build local. It's been real. See you next week.